Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Chicago Blood Cancer Foundation's Battling and Beating Cancer show here on Can TV 21. Our program is all about battling and beating cancer and the steps that you can take to battle this disease. Our focus as the Chicago Blood Cancer Foundation, of course, is on blood cancer, myeloma, leukemia, and lymphoma. And you can call us at 312 738-1060 and ask some questions later on of Dr. Gordon, who's going to be our special guest. And given that uh, every one out of two men in America and more than one out of three women in America will have cancer at some point in their life, you have to be a healthy hermit, really, to never be impacted by cancer. But the point is not to scare you about cancer. The point is to survive the disease. That's what this show is all about. And I'd like to introduce uh, the co-founder of the Chicago Blood Cancer Foundation and our co-host, Charlene McMahon-Seaman, and welcome her to our program today. Thank you, Scott. I'm glad to be here. And just a quick word or two about Chicago Blood Cancer Foundation. We are a nonprofit organization. We refuse to make a penny off of cancer, and we're all about curing lymphoma, leukemia, and myeloma. Uh, by raising uh, funding for research, by raising and promoting public awareness and education about blood cancer. And uh, the thing about cancer is if you want to be on the surviving side of the statistics, when you get that diagnosis of being uh, somebody with cancer, you have to take an active role. And there's a lot of things that you can do. Uh, one, of course, is to get a prompt and proper diagnosis. And sometimes that means following your own intuition because you are the one that knows how you feel. And we know a lot of patients who have gone to a doctor, maybe didn't get the diagnosis, but persisted and ultimately found out uh, that they had cancer. Uh, the other thing that you need to do is get a second opinion because if you're going to have your house painted or you're going to have your engine worked on your, on your car, you don't hesitate to get two mechanics or two painters to bid on the deal. When you're talking about your health, get a second opinion. It's very important. Uh, and get the best doctors that you can get. It really makes a difference. And we promised you the best of the best, and we're going to deliver on that promise tonight with Dr. Leo Gordon, who is one of the top oncologists, hematologists in the country. And he's the director of the lymphoma program uh, at the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center of Northwestern University. And Charlene and Dr. Gordon are going to talk and take your calls, so get online to ask a question of Dr. Gordon. Uh, get the best possible treatments, and we're going to talk about some lymphoma treatments today. Uh, and surround yourself with people who care about you and people who will look out for you because you really need a strong advocate. In my case, it was Charlene, uh, but you really need to have somebody who's going to be part of your team looking out for you, uh, helping you decipher all of the information that you're going to be receiving and make the best possible decisions that you can make uh, and be active and involved in your treatment. Uh, you have to reach out to organizations like the Chicago Blood Cancer Foundation and adopt a cancer warrior mentality, a strong will to live, and the notion that you don't just become a cancer patient, you go on with your life, but there's a lot of things that you need to do to be active in your care and treatment, and uh, it's very important. So uh, today's subject is lymphoma, and very briefly, lymphoma is the most common blood cancer. About 500,000 Americans are battling lymphoma, and lymphoma kills about, about 20,000 Americans every year. It's a very common cancer in children, and while many forms of cancer are going down, the rates of non-Hodgkin lymphoma actually have nearly doubled since the 1970s. So uh, Charlene and Dr. Gordon are going to be talking about lymphoma. Get on the phone at uh, uh, 738-1060 to ask your questions of Dr. Gordon. And we want to talk just very briefly about what the Chicago Blood Cancer Foundation and the people in Chicago are doing to fight back. And again, the importance of raising money and awareness for research. And you can join us on Sunday, September 12th for our Out for Blood bike ride. Uh, and every single dollar that people raise as part of that bike ride will go to cancer research. Uh, and the other important thing to remember is if you're not a bike rider or you're not going to be here, that's no excuse because you can set up a virtual team online and raise money, participate uh, in what is really going to be a great event for blood cancer research. So it's time for me to turn things over to Charlene and our special guest, Dr. Leo Gordon. 
Good evening. Uh, I just wanted to um, briefly introduce uh, Dr. Gordon. Yes, uh, Dr. Leo Gordon. Uh, he's from uh, Northwestern University uh, Medical Center, and I wanted to talk to him tonight about lymphoma. And uh, welcome to Thank our show. Our, Pleasure uh, to be here. Battling and Beating Cancer, a uh, Chicago Blood Cancer Organization. Uh, I wanted to start out uh, with uh, introducing Dr. Gordon a little. And as mentioned, he's the director of the lymphoma uh, program at Rush. Uh, Robert, I'm sorry, Robert H. Lurie, uh, 30 years uh, plus of experience, researcher, clinician, professor, one of the top hematologists, oncologists in the country. Wonderful man, as well as Dr. Our friend, and welcome to Battling Beating Cancer. Thank you very much. And tonight we are going to discuss lymphoma, so I'd like to start out with just some basic questions for our viewers. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is lymph the lymph system? Uh, basically, we can start there. Right. So the, the lymph system is part of the body's natural defense system. It's made up of um, lymph nodes throughout the, throughout the body and also lymphocytes, which circulate in the bloodstream. Uh, also, an integral part of the lymph system is the bone marrow, the spleen, and the liver. And all of those are part of a lymphatic system or lymph system, which its main function is to help fight infection, help, help defense. But when that goes awry, and the reasons for that going awry are many, uh, you can develop lymphoma. So it can occur in any one of those, uh, those areas. Okay. And if you can tell us a little about what, what is lymphoma? So it's, it's mostly, I would think of it as abnormal growth of the mm -hmm. cells that compose the lymph system. So primarily those are lymphocytes. Um, and uh, as they sit in the, in the organ, say on the lymph nodes, you get uh, uncontrolled growth of those lymphocytes. You get enlargement of the lymph nodes. So for the most part, when patients uh, have a diagnosis of lymphoma, the diagnosis is made by finding in large lymph nodes and practically that means a lump usually in the neck or under the arms or in the groin uh, it may also show up as a uh, an enlargement or a mass behind the sternum behind the breastbone so if you patients sometimes show up with a uh, a chest x-ray if done for other reasons and an enlargement is found uh, behind the breastbone and the evaluation then reveals that there's a lymphoma Okay, and there, I know there are various types and subtypes, uh, maybe you can discuss some of those. Right, so there are, first of all, there are probably anywhere from 60 to maybe 65,000 new cases of what we call non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in the U.S. per year, and about maybe 8,000 cases of Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, in the U.S. per year. And we used to think of them as very, very different um, but now as we're beginning to understand them better, we're actually learning that there's a little bit more similarity between those two than there are differences. Non-Hodgkin's lymphomas tend to occur in people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, but you also have people in their 20s and 30s. <clears throat> Hodgkin's lymphoma tends to occur in people mostly in their 20s and 30s, and more rarely in 50s, 60s, and 70 age groups. Uh, so within the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, there are probably 30, at least 30 different types. Uh, about maybe 95% of patients with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma have what we call B-cell lymphoma, and maybe 4% have T-cell lymphoma, and then maybe in 1% we can't tell. We can't really be sure. Uh, so the most common type is B-cell lymphoma, then T-cell lymphoma, and then uncertain. And for practical purposes, however, uh, we can subdivide those 30 types into two major types, those with aggressive lymphoma and those with non-aggressive or indolent lymphoma. And the natural history of those disorders is very different, and the natural history is what drives our treatment approach. Uh, so patients with aggressive lymphoma need treatment immediately, um, and uh, very often a fairly intense course of chemotherapy. Uh, those patients with indolent lymphomas or non-aggressive lymphomas may actually be observed for sometimes many years before they're treated. Mm -hmm. uh, and so patients with the indolent type lymphomas 
uh, although they may have a diagnosis of lymphoma, which is in fact a blood cancer, very often they'll hear a recommendation from their uh, oncologist uh, to observe and not to do treatment. And that's not necessarily at all a bad thing. That mm -hmm. may, we have many patients that can be observed for many years, while those with the aggressive lymphomas, uh, the recommendation will often be treatment early on and, and fairly quickly. Yeah, and I, I know because we we deal with a lot of um, uh, patients who have blood cancer, and there's sometimes there's symptoms, sometimes there isn't symptoms and signs of it. Uh, what would you say the most? Um, I, I guess the best way to put it: what signs would people be looking for in symptoms? Well, as you said, very often there are none, especially with the indolent lymphomas. But if there are symptoms, the things to look for. First of all, the development of a, of a lymph node somewhere or a mass, that's more of a sign that you look for. Uh, that may be associated with a variety of symptoms, such as fever, uh, night sweats, uh, loss of weight, general malaise, not, uh, not feeling well, loss of appetite. So a, a general illness, which is very nonspecific and a little bit sneaky because it can kind of come up on you over pretty rapidly over a period of time and you're not thinking that there's anything anything specifically wrong. It may mimic other illnesses. Uh, and so, uh, but, but those are the kinds of things that we look for. Anything that persists, fevers that persist, weight loss that you can't explain, uh, sweats that are severe, cause you to change your night clothes. Um, those are the kinds of things that we look for. And we realize that you know everybody will have an occasional fever and everybody mm -hmm. will have an occasional sweat. Uh, so I don't want anybody thinking that uh, that is a sign of right, lymphoma. Right, right. And again, because it could be a flu, it could be a cold or something, but it's right. something that's persistent and keeps coming back right. or is, is more than just the normal. Right, um, exactly. And how would you, because we get this question a lot of times too from patients, as far as how would you uh, diagnose, uh, you know, uh, any type of lymphoma? So really the physical exam is probably uh, the most important and maybe the most reliable way to make a diagnosis of lymphoma. So when you're seeing your physician, uh, it, they'll, they'll examine you, they'll look for enlarged lymph nodes in the neck, under the arms, in the groin. They may look for enlargement of the liver or enlargement of the spleen. Those are the things that the physician would look for. In the laboratory, when they do blood tests, there may be anemia. Uh, meaning a low red blood count, the white count may act. The white blood count may actually be elevated, but it may also be lower than normal. And the platelet count, which is a part of the blood which helps to stop bleeding, may be either elevated or, more commonly, may be uh, below normal. Mm -hmm. uh, once the diagnosis is suspected, then I think most physicians would order some imaging tests, and the imaging tests are for the most part CAT scans, uh, which uh, show an anatomic picture of, uh, of the lymph node areas throughout the, throughout the body. So a CAT scan is often part of that di diagnosis. And then if an abnormal lymph node is seen either in the neck or under the arm or it's seen on a CAT scan, the next step would be to do a biopsy. And it's, it's important, I think, to remind people that in order to make a diagnosis, of lymphoma, either non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or Hodgkin's lymphoma, you need enough tissue to make a diagnosis. And I'll, I'll put my first warning out here that the fine needle biopsy that's often done is usually not adequate for a diagnosis of lymphoma. So mm -hmm. I think that if there's an enlarged lymph node present, um, I would say, and lymphoma is suspected, then the fine needle aspirate, which is often the easiest thing and often the first thing that's done, uh, I would say should probably be put on the back burner and, and uh, uh, an excisional biopsy where a surgeon actually takes a small piece of the lymph node or yeah. removes the entire lymph node should be done. And I think you're saying that because as far as what I have, um, you know, learned from my experiences, because when you do the aspiration, is it possible you could miss some of the cells in it? Right. So the asp mm -hmm. the, we know that lymphoma is, can be spotty in a lymph node. Mm -hmm. And if you put the needle in one spot, you may find it. If you put the needle in another spot and you can't tell wh where you're putting the needle, then you may miss it totally. Mm -hmm. And so we often will get sort of the non-diagnostic needle biopsy uh, then 
then the, the regular biopsy has to be done afterwards. Okay. And what are the traditional treatments uh, that you would go with? I know there's radiation, chemotherapy, and a combination. Uh, are those basically the, the traditional treatments that you go with? So, yes, radiation is still an important part of the treatment of many types of lymphomas. Uh, uh, for many years, it was the only treatment that, that we had. And over the years, in the 70s and 80s, uh, it was clear that chemotherapy uh, was effective in lymphoma, and the concept of combining chemotherapy drugs one with another showed that we could improve the results dramatically. Um, and so eventually chemotherapy became part of the, the mainstay of the treatment for both uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and for Hodgkin's disease. And then in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, basic laboratory research, the kind of research that this foundation is trying to, to, to fund, um, revealed that most patients, maybe 90% of patients with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, mostly the, the B-cell lymphomas, have a protein on the surface of their cell called CD20. And that protein then becomes a target uh, for new treatments. And that development of that protein, the recognition of that protein, led to the development of an antibody. That antibody uh, is, was eventually named rituximab or mm -hmm. rituxin. And that, starting in the mid-90s, we started research in that in the early 90s. The, uh, the drug was approved in 1996 or 97 for the treatment of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, mostly for the indolent or low-grade lymphomas. And then people started recognizing that if you combine that rituxin with chemotherapy, the response rates dramatically uh, improve. Mm -hmm. And so I would say today for patients with B-cell, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, either aggressive or indolent, that rituxin is part of the initial treatment. Uh, and actually, there's, there are good data now that it may be part of what's called a maintenance treatment for some patients uh, with, with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So now I would say the mainstay of treatment for most patients with lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's type, is uh, rituxin plus some chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So you're basically using it as the traditional treatment, the rituxin now, because it, it, at first it was kind of, uh, doctors were kind of leery to use it too much because of the um, uh, suppressing uh, the immune system. Right. So it does suppress normal B cell function, and there is a certain, one of its, its risks may be the development of infections. Uh, from what we're seeing, though, the, the risk of infection is really no higher than it is maybe with chemotherapy. And if you use rituxin alone, which in many lymphomas you can do, uh, that risk really isn't above what you'd expect to see. Uh, if it's given endlessly and continually, then the risk starts to, to go up, we think. so. Mm -hmm. But I think it's an important part of the treatment of any of the B-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. Well, it almost seems kind of like a, a little miracle drug that's been uh, put out there. Would you kind of call it that? or? <laughs> well, I think it's... It, I, <laughs> one, I guess one of them. It's that, one of them. I, yeah, I think it's an important mm -hmm. uh, milestone and, in the treatment of, of lymphoma. And what I would stress is that it didn't just happen, um, wasn't an accident. It happened with a lot of very important, carefully done... Uh, basic research that took a long time to do, uh, took lots of funds to do, and took some smart people to figure out. And uh, I think it's that kind of uh, advance that we're looking for. Again, we're looking for the newer rituxin. We're looking for a better rituxin. Right. We're looking for a better understanding of how lymphomas grow and how we can make them die. That's really, mm -hmm. that's really. And that's why we need research. And, and to give what, research right. dollars in, in hands like yours so we can find new treatments and uh, a cure down the road. Right. So right. Uh, what, as far as like with the new treatments that you have, the traditional new treatments like rituxin, what's the prognosis and survival rates that you're seeing now with the, um, the better treatments? Let's put it right. that way. Right. So, so first of all, I, I, without being specific about any one type, it, what we've seen first in the aggressive lymphomas, where the initial chemotherapy could be cured in a significant proportion of patients. Uh, whereas before, if you took the worst case scenario, somebody with a very aggressive lymphoma, maybe only you know, 15 or 20 percent of patients um, were still functioning normally without disease 10 years later. Now I think we're seeing 50 or 60 percent uh, of patients mm -hmm. um, at the, in the worst case scenario. Uh, in, in the best case scenario, it's 
90 to 95 percent of patients uh, may be cured of their disease with very early diagnosis and uh, what and a disease that has certain characteristics without disease presenting without a lot of symptoms so we've improved the worst case scenario from 10 or 15 percent to greater than 50 percent mm -hmm. so i think that that's a major improvement and in the low-grade lymphomas we're now seeing prolonged survival uh, without disease such that we it's hard to even measure the median since the introduction of rituxan we don't know what the median survival is because we haven't reached it yet mm -hmm. uh, many years after mm -hmm. the development so we do think that the, that the use of, of these new antibodies like rituxan has led to uh, striking improvements in the cure rate both for not for the low grade and for the high grade lymphomas. Mm -hmm. And as far as I, again I'm going to go back to the research uh, development and the impact that research uh, if you could just briefly say again how important uh, research is to in impacting uh, newer treatments. So there, I think there's two forms of research that are equally important. You need the basic observations in the laboratory from basic scientists uh, to recognize what causes these cells to grow, what causes these cells to die, and to recognize these proteins that you're trying to target. And then you need clinical research uh, from, uh, that it's done primarily by clinicians, by uh, uh, people who are working with patients, to translate those basic observations from the laboratory into the patients. And the reason that's so important is sometimes the basic scientists uh, are, are sort of following the lead of the basic science but not necessarily thinking about how it's going to apply to patients and it takes that collaborative effort between basic scientists and clinicians which is what's being done at most uh, academic medical centers now mm -hmm. uh, to really translate it into some meaningful improvement in survival for, for patients. Okay, uh, we're going to, time's running, running out on us here so I'm going to ask you briefly if you can just um, you know, maybe give some information to uh, patients who have lymphoma, or where they can contact you, and how patients can contact you. Well, I, I think that um, there there are public there are other publications that come out through uh, the National Cancer Institute, through a variety of other uh, research foundations in lymphoma, uh, Lymphoma Research Foundation, National Cancer Institute, where people can get information about lymphoma. Uh, people can go to any any research institution, or really any hospital, but certainly any research institution where there's a specific interest in lymphoma, um, and go to either the Northwestern website, the Rush website, a variety of other or places, blood. or the Chicago <laughs> Blood Cancer, <laughs> of course, Foundation yes. website to try uh -huh. and get information about um, about new treatments and mm -hmm. new clinical trials, and also how to talk to some of the people that are doing research in this area. It's not necessary to um, to actually uh, necessarily see somebody in an academic center if you've already gotten a couple of opinions, as, as, as Scott has mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think most of us would be very happy to talk over the phone with uh, patients and with their doctors about new treatments that might be available. Well, and I know uh, just on a personal basis, uh, Dr. Gordon, you are just really uh, tremendous with your patients, and, and the things you have done for them is just remarkable. And I know a lot of them, so... Thank and you're you living much. well today and uh, surviving. So I want to thank uh, again uh, Dr. Leo Gordon uh, from uh, Robert H. Lurie uh, Northwestern University Medical Center. And I want to thank you so much for uh, being our guest today. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, we're going to no uh, just no take one moment. No. And then uh, I wanted to just give you our website again. It's Chicago Blood Cancer Foundation, and it's www.chicagobloodcancer.org. And our telephone number is 888-792-9292. I'm sorry, 9992. And now we're going to bring Scott here, and he can talk a little to you. And so, ladies and gentlemen, you've learned as much as you can possibly learn in 25 minutes about lymphoma from one of the best in the business. Join us next week uh, for Battling and Beating Cancer, and our guest is going to be Dr. Howard Kaufman, the Cancer Program Director at Rush University Medical Center. And our topic, which is a great uh, follow-up from today, is cancer research is the key to our long-term survival. We'll see you next time here on Battling and Beating Cancer.